On today's show, Team USA might be better off benching Joel Embiid, but who should take his place? And does Embiid Sixers have the best chance in the East to knock off the Celtics? Or is it the Knicks? All of that and more on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On NBA Friday. Wes Goldberg here with Adam Mates. However, you might be tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everybody every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. We're going to play a game of Would You Rather today, Adam. Uh, It's an easy idea. I'll ask you a Would You Rather question. It'll be something to do with the NBA, and then you'll answer. So uh, we've got questions about the best young core in the NBA, building around Kawhi Leonard versus other stars, who the Warriors should trade for Larry Markkinen. But let's start with the newsiest item here, Team USA. Uh, Would you rather start Joel Embiid on Team USA? Or Bam Adebayo. So just some background really quick before you answer. I could have gone with like Embiid or Anthony Davis, but that felt a little too easy. So I decided yeah. to go with the third string center. This okay. is off of Team USA's tough. Like, they blew out Serbia, but not because of Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid really struggled in that game. And their best <laughs> moments came when Anthony Davis and Bam Adebayo were together in that front court. That's just, um, by the way, through three friendlies, it's been yeah. the same. It's been, we talked about this, I think, last week where the FIBA rules and that whole atmosphere might not lend itself to Joel Embiid and (laughs) is probably better suited for guys like Bam and AD. But would you rather make that wholesale change, start the third string center, Bam Adebayo, over the current first string center in Joel Embiid? It feels like such a hot take, doesn't it? But it's Bam Adebayo. Here's the thing. First of all, the real answer is Anthony Davis. I just think Anthony Davis' skill set is perfect for being in the role that would be required of that. You've got so much scoring around throw Anthony Davis there. He's going to do everything defensively. He's versatile. He's switchable. He's a rim protector. So I think he's the easy answer. But when here's the thing about Joel Embiid. I'm not sure he is great at sharing the floor with other great players. And this has been true, not just of a super team like this, but I think it has been true of, you know, James Harden was the exception. Those two obviously had an incredible pick and roll, you know, but even that was more of the two of them, right? And then you have three guys that are very low leverage out of the way. I think when you look at a team like this, number one in FIBA, because you can play zone, you can pack the paint, ball movement is so important. You can't you can't have guys holding the ball for long periods of time. Well, he always loves to hold the ball and kind of survey and figure out what he's going to do. So I just think that offensively, the ball's going to get popping a lot more with Bam Adebayo, who makes quick decisions. He's not really looking to score first. He's looking to facilitate and do other things, screen. I think it's clearly him. Defensively, I think it's a wash. You know, Joel Embiid's obviously an incredible rim protector. He can do a lot of stuff. Bam Bam Adebayo, very switchable, can do a lot of stuff. But offensively, I just think your offense is going to flow so much more. And I think your offense needs to be LeBron James, Steph Curry, Anthony Edwards. You know, some of these other guys, not necessarily dump it into the elbow and let a guy take 10 seconds to make a move. Yeah, it sounds almost crazy, right? Because Joel Embiid is so dominant with the ball in his hands. He's such a dominant offensive yeah. scoring player. And yet, in this context, you would rather that offense run through Steph, LeBron, and all that, which I guess it's not that crazy because it's still Steph, LeBron, <laughs> Jason Tatum, Devin Booker. But it does sound kind of wild that what worked at an historic level last NBA season is not working at all, so far at least, at FIBA. And yeah, he's missing shots too, which I think is a big part of it. I mean, he smoked that one layup at FIBA. I don't know what kind of shape he's totally it, in. Yeah, he's, there's an, he's there's another shape. reason maybe to bring him off the bench is like, yeah, maybe we don't need you for starters minutes here. Steve Kerr did say, we didn't say, he suggested that he might experiment with some other lineups, and that could include Joel Embiid coming off the bench. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It just feels so weird to have sort of won the Joel Embiid citizenship sweepstakes, <laughs> and it just not really work. Yeah. Right now. Well, hold on. Time out. Time out. The real answer is it does not matter at all. That's fair. like they, I think they could start you at center, and they'd probably still be just fine. I mean, this Team USA looks incredible. They look like they have no weaknesses. Uh, That being said, Wes, the politics of Team USA are part of the most interesting dynamic. And by the way, remember, when they assembled the Dream Team in 2008, it was supposed to be the end of politics. We're not doing any of this. We we might start a role player. It doesn't matter. Everybody's here to pull in the same direction. It's evolved back to 
well, we did this guy committed to play for us and we got to start him now. And I don't know, right. we got to do this. So it is a little weird that they would say that they would make a decision based on that. But I kind of feel like they will make a decision based on that. Let's shift gears. Would you rather go into an Eastern Conference final series against the Boston Celtics with mm -hmm. the Knicks roster <clears throat> or the 76ers roster? Man, this is going to be the Joe Embiid haters, Paul. <laughs> We're going to get <laughs> go ahead and leave your comment. You guys could throw egg on my face in the comments. It's fine. And this one's actually really close because Embiid is so dominant, especially when you talk about this series where he does get now to go back to being the main focus point and, you know, he's in his comfort zone. And I think that he could put pressure on the thin front court of the New York Knicks. So you could say that would be the, the, you, you, I can see the argument of why it would be them. The thin front court of the Celtics. Uh, of the Celtics. Sorry, sorry. Of the yes, yes. Yep. But if you go over to the Knicks now, what makes the Celtics so dynamic is they're uh, they have dribble penetration from everybody. They have shooting from everybody. That's hard. You're scrambled. The Knicks are the best team, perhaps in the NBA, at defending that. They have so many shut down wings, such a switchable lineup. Not they have too many to start. One of one or two of them is going to have to come off the bench. They've got waves of defenders to shut down that dribble drive game. So I think I lean Knicks on this one, but I think both teams have a case for at least you know I think they'd be underdogs, but have a case to beat them. So my problem with the Knicks is that. They are built to match up with the Boston Celtics, but they're not built to beat the Boston Celtics. Ooh, if you know what I mean? You know, they're they're just a worse version of the Boston Celtics, where I kind of like the Sixers strategy here of you mentioned Embiid pounding that thinner front court, all those things. That's that's rock trying to beat scissors. Hmm. The Knicks feel like they're trying to beat scissors with a toenail clipper. <laughs> You know, and I, I don't know <laughs> that's, that's going to... That's too much, man. That's too, I would say with a slightly smaller pair of scissors. I don't know if I'd do a toenail <laughs> Yeah, yeah like, the, uh, like the beard scissors or something. You know what I mean? Okay. Like, yeah. So it's a sharp object. Um, and that's where I kind of keep ending up with the Knicks is unless the Celtics get hurt, I don't know what the pathway is for the Knicks. Knicks fans would say, well, Jalen Brunson could be the best player on the court in a series. Yeah, maybe. Jason Tatum's really good. Like, yeah, I, you know, like cool. Julius Randle is really important to that Knicks team now yeah. in terms of a matchup advantage creator. But I don't, I, unless the Celtics get hurt, it's hard to see the pathway for the, the Knicks actually winning that series. And the Knicks are the team that is more injury prone than the Celtics, right? I mean, OG Ananobi, Jalen Brunson's a smaller guard. Yeah. We don't know. Mitchell Robinson is really important to this team now too. They don't have Isaiah Hardenstein anymore. So I don't know. I, I, I would go... Sixers, but the problem is, can the Sixers stay healthy up until the Eastern Conference Finals? That's the biggest right. question here, but that's not really the would you rather question. All right, um, let's do one more uh, before we get into our next batch of these. Would you rather, this one's actually pretty crazy, would you rather have the top three picks in this year's draft? So you got the top three mm -hmm. picks, you do whatever you want, you're building your team. You get the top three picks in this year's draft, would you rather have that or the number one pick in next year's draft? So you're really asking me. So this is what it comes down to. You got Risa Shea, you've got Saar, and you've got Reed Shepard. Well, you could have done anything you wanted to do with the three picks. Trust me. Oh, you could I have see. taken like Donald well, in hindsight, you know who yeah. I would have taken. Yeah. So I don't know about that. I think this is really, it really to me comes down to Reed Shepard versus the versus Cooper Flag. And I love Reed Shepard. I mm -hmm. love him. I think he's incredible. But the easy answer here is Cooper Flag, who looks phenomenal. He looks like a you know. I'm not sure if I'm ready to go like cornerstone. This is for sure our guy and and, and everything goes around him because he almost feels more like a high profile, like a high level team player than he does like a give him the ball kind of star, right. which is a good thing. That's not a bad yeah. thing. I like that multiplayer, but I think it's easily Cooper flag. So I would take the one next year, despite the fact that I absolutely love Reed Shepard and think he might be a very strong contributor right out the package. Isn't that wild? I, I agree with you, which yeah. is an insane. Like, I don't know that you would ever say this about any other draft, right? Yeah, you would. The, like, uh, the, the Anthony, Anthony Bennett, Bennett draft. Yeah. yeah, the Anthony Bennett draft, man. There was like six in a row. Yeah, Victor Oladipo and Anthony Bennett or... Yeah, <laughs> Cooper Flag, uh, come on. Cooper Flag. Uh, I do. I kind of went through the draft. I'm like, okay, how would I have done the top three? I'm not the biggest Risa Shea fan. I'd love to be proven wrong with that. Uh, I'm not the biggest Alex Saar fan. I'd love to be proven wrong with that. I would have went Reed Shepard. Like, could you give me Reed Shepard... Donovan Klingon and one like a Stefan Castle or something like that. Now that, that <laughs> you had to think about it for a second, that I know. just tells you the answer. <laughs> exactly. I'm still I'm still taking Cooper Flag, which yeah. is absolutely wild. All right. For our next question, which young player should the Warriors include in a Lowry Markinen trade? I think we're gonna disagree on this one, Adam. Mm. More would you rather after this on Locked On NBA. 
Today's episode of Locked on NBA is brought to you by FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much that I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games in the sports. They aren't sporting like we want them to. But sport that, but FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app, dream up the bets anytime that I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everybody every day, all summer long. So go to FanDuel.com and start making the most of your summer. They already have... A, a rookie of the year futures up and i don't know if mm. you've looked at the FanDuel odds zach Eady, and this is across most sports book zach Eady is the favorite to win rookie wow of the year. now i like it i like it fine i think zach Eady is going to be a production machine this guy is he can average like 13 and 13 as a rookie probably with with some blo- uh, like five blocks a game or something crazy but um i was looking back the last time a rookie that was not selected in the top four, one rookie of the year, was in 2017 when Malcolm Brogdon took it in that weird rookie mm, class. So mm. uh, usually <laughs> this good is gonna, there, it's usually going to go to one of the top four guys. So we look at the strats. It's Riza Shea, Alex Sar, Reed Shepard, and Stefan Castle. You and I love Reed Shepard. Yeah, but he's got How a, much time is he going to get? Yeah, a lot of young guys on that team. Stephon Although Castle he's going to get a lot been, of time, man. He's going to beat out those guys. Come on, that is. guy's filthy. I'm all in on him. I'm all in on Reed Shepard. So I would, I might go Reed Shepard, but I like Stephon Castle. He's been sidelined a bit because he yeah. played only one summer league game, and then he was ruled out for the rest of it with this wrist injury. But he had like 22 points in that game. He's going to start. He's going to throw a lot of passes to Victor Webinyama. Those are easy assists. That's box score st- uh, pa- uh, pat statting there, stat padding. Uh He's, I think he's going to score a bunch of points. I think he's going to rebound. I think he's going to get some steals. He was the fourth pick in this year's draft. Plays for a Spurs team that people are going to be paying attention to just because of Victor Wembanyama. I kind of like Stefan Castle. FanDuel has his odds at plus 1,000. That's good yeah. odds. That's there a good you bet. Go. That's a good bet right. right there from West. FanDuel, official They don't call him Goldberg for nothing. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Visit FanDuel.com to look at the odds. And... Make your bets. Thanks for making Locked on NBA your first listen every day. The best way to support us is to subscribe on YouTube. You can also follow us on your favorite podcast app. More Would You Rather. Let's jump right in. If you're the Warriors, would you rather trade Podzemski or Kaminga in a deal for Lowry Markkinen? Latest mm. reporting on this, just for some background uh, from The Athletic, is that the Jazz were asking for all of them. The Warriors were not, in, when I say all of them, all the picks, all the young players, Moody, Pods, Kaminga. And the Warriors said, how about just Moody and all the picks? Logically, I don't know, you would think maybe you meet somewhere in the middle. It's not all of the rookies, but it's Moody plus one of the high-level ones where it's either Pods or Mark, uh, or um, Kaminga. So if you're the Warriors, you're the GM, it's up to you, right? Maybe Danny Andrews says, you just pick whichever one, and then we'll take it. Which one are you picking to send out? This is the funny one, because for me, I'm taking Kaminga, that I would rather keep, so I'd rather trade Pajemski. Mm -hmm. But it sure seems like everyone in the organization feels the other way, and that tells you something, right? That tells you something about how they value him behind the scenes and what they believe he's going to get out of himself. I like his skill set. He's so strong. He's got a good shot. There's things. There's a great player that he can grow into but it seems like no one has the faith that he's going to do that so i would go with kaminga but i feel like i would be picking the wrong one yeah i'm going pods here um you'd keep, you'd keep pods i'm keeping pods i'm sending out kaminga i like kaminga a lot as a player i think he might have gotten drafted to the worst possible situation for him yeah in golden state you know he need this is a guy who needed some space he needed <laughs> like a lot of yard right yeah. to kind of grow his game and he didn't yeah. really get that in golden state he had to play a very specific role and sometimes you see players thrive with that but i just felt like there was so much untapped potential with kaminga that it was unclear what his role should even be in the nba other than just being big and athletic and that's essentially all he's been able to do with the warriors save for like when they get really hurt and then they just like kind of let him hoop a little bit so pods has just been an easier <laughs> fit the other part the other part of this too is if you're acquiring a guy like markinen and you're keeping kaminga He's getting even less yard, right? Like there's less stuff for him to do now oh, because you want the point. ball in Steph and, and Markkinen and Draymond Green's hands. I don't know. I, I like Kaminga a lot. He's also got this rookie contract extension ready to come. That could get weird, right? If he's not getting the ball, if he's not getting that usage, 
that he's going to need to get a 20 plus million dollar contract or whatever it is that he's going to want this could get rocky between now and the trade deadline so we and we already saw some of the politics and the agents get involved even last year with the warriors and they did a good job of smoothing that over but can they do it twice i don't know so i would just sort of cut my losses and just say you know what we turned kaminga into an all-star in marketing who just fits a little bit better with what we want to do that's a win it's not like we're selling short on kaminga we're upgrading the yeah. team we turned this draft pick that we should have never had in the first place into something very valuable for us. And by the way, we still have pods who, like you said, everybody in the organization likes. So I'd yeah. go I'd go keeping pods. So I think you're right, man. He doesn't have a lot of yard. In fact, I'd say he's in the doghouse. Um, yeah. And sometimes you got to throw him a bone, you know, and Ooh. he's got that dog in him. So, you know, you can... How much more can, can we keep doing I don't know. That this? was a great metaphor, chain. <laughs> I'm just like, keep it? going, man. You got to roll. All right. Would you rather trade for... Brandon Ingram, who's on an expiring contract, or Jeremy Grant, who is, plays basically the same position, but is under contract for basically this half decade at thirty million ish a year. Oh man, <laughs> this is the worst would you rather ever. <laughs> oh man, I think I'm going with Jeremy Grant. I feel the same way about both of these players. Here, here's what it really comes down to: I don't have faith that either of these guys are winning players. And I don't have faith that either of these guys will justify the contract that will be their market value because they're both so talented that they command the money. Obviously, Jeremy Grant has it. Brandon Ingram is going to command. If you trade for him, you're going to have to end up paying him You know, right after that because they're talented and there's enough hope. And in the NBA, you got to bet on hope sometimes. But I don't count on either of them. The difference is I really don't count on Brandon Ingram to mm -hmm. care about the game, to care about being part of a team, to, to, you know, to being all that. With Jeremy Grant, I think... I don't buy it either, but I think you could probably work with the way he plays a little bit more than Ingram. Ingram can pout on the floor if it's not the game's not going through him, whereas Jeremy Grant, I think, will just quietly sulk. I think with this new, as the cap goes up to, Grant's contract will look a little bit less bad, right? The big part, the big issue yeah, Grant is yeah. that he's already, what, 30 years old, and he's going to be 34, 35 when this contract ends up being yeah. done. It's like, how many more good years does this guy have? But he's an insane athlete. I know he can defend. He could score a little bit. Uh, you probably want him more as sort of that second side score as opposed to your primary score. Where Brandon Ingram is probably also best used in that role, but don't tell him that. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's so I'm with you. And if Brent, uh, Ingram is going to come off the book, he, his contract is expiring. You're going to have to extend him or re-sign him. He's going to be a really interesting uh, case study in a guy that in the old CBA almost always just got the max. You just gave it to him because he could score 25 points per game, and those guys just get it. Where in this new CBA, you can only really carry two max players. And I don't know that anybody with championship goals looks at Brandon Ingram as being one of like the two guys you can win a championship with. If that yeah. if you're gonna have two max guys and one of them is Brandon Ingram, that's a tough way to build your team. And that's the problem that the Pelicans are in right now, not just in whether or not they decide to keep Ingram, which I obviously don't want to, but trying to find a spot for him, trying to find a place to trade him to, because no team wants to pay him this money. So can he get negotiated down to maybe closer to Jeremy Grant money. And if that's the case, I still think I want Grant because like you said, it's just a little bit easier to place him on a team with maybe some primary scoring already. So I'll go Grant. Um, would you rather sign Jalen Green or Evan Mobley to a maximum rookie extension? Man. These are getting worse, not better. No, this one's better for me. It's easily Mobley. Jalen okay. Green to me, <clears throat> he has the talent, but like Ingram, I'm not sure he's going to get it. And it's in a different direction, but you don't know if he is learning the game the way it's, you know, that it's going to benefit him down the road because he has all the talent. Evan Mobley, I think, his talent is easier. His personality, I think, is also easier to fit into what he needs to be. He can be an Anthony Davis light, uh, you know, in terms of mostly defense with, with a capable offensive game, which is, I think, what he needs to be. I don't know that Cleveland has used him the best, mm. to be honest, in your time there, giving him the Twin Tower lineup. So for me, this one's actually not so hard. It's, it's Mobley. Yeah. I think I'm there too. Jalen Green finished the year really strong uh, for the yep. Rockets last year. I mean, he averaged, uh, what was it, like 24 points per game on 44% <coughs> shooting, 37% yep. from three point range. As soon as Shangun got hurt. Assists on the la right, when Shangun got hurt. Those were, those were the stats for his last 15 games. Uh, but you're, I don't know. Defensively, there's question marks. As a playmaker, there's question marks. He, is he Brandon Ingram, that, but smaller? You know, it's is a fair question. Uh, where, yeah, the guy could put up points on the board, but is he actually contributing to winning? Evan Mobley, I would be really hesitant to pay him a max rookie contract because 
His offensive thing is such a question mark. And defensively, he's really good. But he's not defensive player of the year level on defense yet. And maybe part of that is just what's going on in Cleveland and maybe less of him. I would be really hesitant to pay either of these guys the max money, but I'd feel a lot more comfortable giving it to Mobley than I would Jalen Green. All right. Speaking of the Houston Rockets, would you rather have the Houston Rockets or the Orlando Magic young core? Man, we I think we did this one at some point in the season. Hmm. I, I remember talking about this one at, at some point in the season, and it was such a controversial one. I think everybody at the time thought we would be idiots if we didn't say the Orlando Magic as evidenced by where they were in the standings. But now you talk about adding Reed Shepard to the I know, mix. that's where I'm at. I love Cam Whitmore, who wasn't playing a yeah. ton at the time, I think, when we did this. I, it's wild to say because, again, Orlando is a proven core, but I, I still go Houston. I like Houston's core. I think they need – here's the thing with Houston this year. They need to move off of some of the core because at a certain point, you start to cannibalize your own core, yeah. and they have too many guys that somebody is going to be left out. Jalen Green would probably be a guy that I would move on from at, 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 the, at least to start things off. But I love Reed Shepard, love Cam Whitmore, love Tari Eason. Uh, like Shingoon, you know, like uh, Amen Thompson. They have so many players, man. Um, I think it's them. Yeah, I think at first blush, I'd say the Orlando Magic because Jabari. they've got Paolo Gimper- uh Paolo Gim- oh, Pag Carroll, yeah. Paolo Gimpero. Easy for you to say. Yeah, uh, who's a guy. Like, I know that guy could be one of the top two players at some point, four or five years from now. He could, That feels like that could be one of the top two players on a championship team to me. Am I sure that the Houston Rockets have that guy? Does this question really come down to, would you rather have Van Caro or Shangun? Maybe. But then you add the whole Reed Shepard thing into this mix, and I don't want to make too much out of a couple of summer league games, but that guy looks awesome. And I don't know that there's a whole lot of guys that I'm taking over him in this draft class. And if Reed Shepard could become one of these guys, I don't know. I, I like the numbers that Houston has. I, For variety's sake, I might just still go Orlando. Just because I know I have the one guy for sure in Bancaro. And personally, Jalen Suggs might be one of my top six or seven favorite guys to watch. Oh, in the NBA. The best. I, I love just, I don't even care about him offensively. Just love watching him just fight over screens. It's like one of the joys of the NBA. All right. Would you rather have Kawhi Leonard or this other often injured superstar to build around? We'll talk about that. Plus, what's the best perk that NBA players have in their everyday life thanks to the new CBA? All of that and more next. <laughs> On Locked on NBA. Thanks for making Locked on NBA your first listen every day. Let's jump right back into Would You Rather. Would you rather have Kawhi Leonard or Jimmy Butler as your number one guy? This one I think is also easy to me. It's Kawhi Leonard, and I love Jimmy Butler. He's got more dog in him, I would say, than mm-hmm. than Kawhi Leonard. But that outside of that, what else does he have? Kawhi Leonard's incredible. Uh, both of them are a health question. <laughs> um, Kawhi Leonard probably a bigger health question at the moment. I think that that would also be another thing that you'd put uh, in Jimmy Butler's favor. But Kawhi's an incredible player, and even at his peak this year. At this age, you know, and everything else, he still would look like he could go toe to toe with anybody. Mm-hmm. The problem is that peak seems to last about a month before he breaks down. Um, but I'd still go with Kawhi Leonard. You might thread the needle and just get him healthy at the exact right time. That's the hope. I'm going Jimmy Butler here. Ooh. Uh, I just, I have two rules in the NBA, right? Uh, number one, never watch the Charlotte Hornets after the trade deadline. Okay. And number two, <laughs> never trust a team led by Kawhi Leonard. Okay. Well, you were wrong twice. What do you mean? <laughs> well, Kawhi, Kawhi's team won twice, so he has oh, two right. championships. Well, so. Since 2019. They're oh, okay. new rules. These are okay. new, newly oh, developed a... rules. Um, so uh, I thought you were like, what was I wrong about in the Hornets? Did I miss I a know. great game in March or something? <laughs> uh, so I I just, I'll take Jimmy. I'll take Jimmy because I the problem with Kawhi is no doubt when he's healthy, he's the better player. I'm not questioning that. But and the better player more consistently. But he hasn't finished a, a postseason in three years. It's, I know Jimmy Butler was injured for these last playoffs, but he generally speaking has his best moments and saves his best for the playoffs. I'd rather have that than the guy that's not going to finish the playoffs. And Kawhi's just not a leader. And this is like an old school take, but I like the Jimmy Butler bravado, the leadership stuff, the fact that like, okay, if he's our number one guy, I know that the role players on the team are going to run through a wall for that guy where I think that, 
if you're Kawhi's teammate, how frustrating does that have to be? And I would love to <coughs> get like Paul George some truth serum and say, okay, how much did the not knowing whether or not Kawhi was going to be available or not actually factor into your decision to leave the Clippers? Because it's easy to blame the bosses. That's the easiest place to always place blame. Blame the bosses, blame the money, walk away. Politics are still intact. You're not making any enemies. But I bet in his heart of hearts, he must have been also frustrated. Like, okay, am I the number one guy? Am I the number two guy? Am I the number three guy? Every other night based on who is available. So um, give me Jimmy. Give me okay. Jimmy. Um, all right. This one's for you. Yes. Um, so I don't know if you saw this, uh, and I'm going to preface this by saying this. I saw this on Reddit, and I don't know how true Ooh, it is. Yeah, perfect. But, uh, I'm already in. However, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, there was a list of player perks within the new CBA making its rounds on Reddit, and I found this very interesting. Again, I don't know if this is correct or not, but that's not even the point. It does, does, doesn't matter. We're, we're going with it. Doesn't matter. So you get two player perks. Would you rather have one of these two player perks? Number okay. one, the meal reimbursement plan. Players get $156 a day for meals during travel. Okay. Okay. Or would you ha rather have the travel expenses perk? Teams must provide first class accommodations if the trip exceeds one hour. If first class is unavailable, coaches can fly first class and players receive compensation for the difference. By the way, I'm just going to make this, I'm going to make a point. Teams must provide first class accommodations if the trip exceeds one hour. That's all trips. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Well, all. Denver to Salt Lake. You're. I'm sorry. You're in the back. You're sitting in the back there. What is that? Forty five minutes. Yeah, it's. A, you're up and down. You know, yeah, it's tough. It's either that one or it's like Staples to Staples. If you're the Clippers <laughs> and the Lakers, right? You don't get. You don't get that one. But or maybe Golden State to Sacramento. But other than that, first class all the way, baby. Okay. Um, I think financially it would be smart to take the second one. I think that's the one that probably has the you know more dollar value. But you know, Wes, I'm a guy that likes to eat. I like to go to a nice restaurant. I like to chase things out. I'll take what was it, $156? Exactly. <laughs> That'll pay half of my eating expenses if I'm an NBA player. Because I'm not eating Chipotle. I'm eating, you know, I'm going out for steak <laughs> and lobster every single night. So $156, that gets me about halfway there. I'm going with the travel one. That's the you smart had me one. At first, yeah, you had me at first class, man. Like yeah. I'm I have like a personal rule. Like if I'm going overseas to a different country or something i'll do my best to get first class just because but an hour flight like you're telling me i can fly from miami to atlanta for work and it's and i get first class on that yeah it'd be great miami to new york first class every time and then if you don't get it you just take the money like financially i could just say you know what i don't need first class i'm good in just like my standard legroom seat yeah. give me the thousand dollars and i could just put that in my pocket because i get reimbursed for it if i if first class isn't available Taking that one. Then I could take that money and spend a great spend it on a meal later. Um, all right. It's Friday, which means it's time to count down to the weekend with our weekly power rankings. Here's the music. Not a system player. I am a system player. Go go power rankings. Go go power rankings. What do you have for us today, Adam? Well, I was sitting here thinking while well, I've been just exhausted covering NBA Summer League, you know, just exhausted because you go right from the finals into the draft, into free agency, into Summer League. It just doesn't end. I would like to change the schedule. I'd love okay. to change the calendar, the NBA calendar and how it operates. So I have five changes that I'm looking to bring to make it a better workflow. For me personally, this is not better for the players. It's not better <laughs> for the organization. This is your this calendar. This is better for me. I love the this. person and that's and nobody else. The, the most selfish third segment we've ever had on Lockdown NBA. Let's go. <laughs> Number one, we're going to move the draft and free agency to July. There it goes. I don't, I, I mean, I'm telling you, when the ch championship happens and everybody writes their final article, it's like, oh, the Boston Celtics won a historic team. And then the very next day, it's like, anyway, we're moving on to the draft <laughs> now. And it's like, immediately goes, it feels, right. it doesn't feel ceremonial. Like, you need to have something where it just feel like you sit in it for a moment of like, all right, let's all bask in what just happened on this year. And to give some distance. So I propose everybody gets to go on vacation. You do the parade. Everyone gets a little vacation. And we reconvene mid-July. Also, Wes, 4th of July, my favorite holiday. But yet I have to sit by the phone. I'm checking messages. I'm making sure Woj right. hasn't tweeted because all this stuff is happening. Let everybody get away for the 4th of July. Let's come back second week of July and we'll pick the season back up. I, this is great. And I think the thing that the NBA does not do well is talk about itself. 
in terms of what the sport is, right? right? We do a good job of talking about what's happening next, but we do a very bad job of talking about what has already happened in the NBA, unless it's like 10 years from now. And we're talking about like the NBA's top 75 team or something or whatever it is and start, like it does a good job of celebrating its history, but does not do a good job of talking about what just happened. And I think about like Adam Silver's comments, was it last year about how he wanted the, the discourse around the NBA to be more like it is around the NFL, where it's focusing a little bit more on the, on the, on the floor product. And I think this would do a really good job of doing that because you're so right. The Celtics win the championship, the Nuggets win the year before, and it's like sick. Okay, but like who we who what superstar is going to get traded? Right, in two yep. weeks immediately, man, and immediately. And so it would be a night. It would be nice to actually reflect for everybody. Say, okay, what just <laughs> happened this NBA season? Not just with who won, but what happened to this team and that team? What happened to my team? All this kind of stuff. I think it would be good. And then, like you said, create some space so that the yeah. NBA fan can also partake in that and. Take advantage of that, and then yeah, then you get to the stuff, and because nobody also pays attention. Like you want to create a runway to the draft and free agency, yeah. where the league doesn't really have that. A casual fan isn't paying attention to the NBA draft during right. the NBA season. They turn around and like, wait, who's this that's getting drafted? Read who? What? Yeah, he's got two last names. Too much, I don't too understand. quick, man. Too quick. Yep. Yep. So create I think some that's distance a good one. here. Number two, I'd move summer league to right before training camp. This would be like first week of September. Oh, first week of this September. Is good. So another thing, like you got all the coaches out there, they same thing. They've been going, 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 no breaks. I'd rather you let these guys go to summer league. And it's almost like you get to make summer league a little bit different. You're making it now. Like we're teaching the guys terminology. We're getting a mm. run at them. And, you know, you can spend the summer with them doing workouts and doing different things. I just think it'd be a better product. And also it would lead in nicely right into the season. Like, okay, you go right from that into your training camps. It feels again, like it connects everything, but creates real breaks in the middle of the summer, which is what you want. You want the teams to have a little break in the summer. You're right. And it is a little weird how summer league works now. Cause you get like the summer league tournament thing in, ju in July. Right. And then everybody's off for basically yeah. a month and a half. And then it's like, you go back to, and then you go back to a uh, training camp and everybody's like, Oh, Hey, I remember you. So yeah. By, I like by the way, Summer League could be like three games. They do the whole like four <laughs> games and then a tournament and nobody's even paying attention by then. You know, everybody goes out there for about four days and that's then everyone goes home. Just three games. Shorten everybody it. plays three games. That's it. It's a little exhibition. There's no tournament. There's no championship. We don't need it. Nobody cares. Yeah. Just do it a Friday to a Monday. Everybody leaves Tuesday. <laughs> there you go. Done. Cheap flights out of Vegas on a Tuesday. Man, we're right. solving so many problems over here. Name us commissioner. What's next? The next one. Move the in-season tournament. To the very first week of the year, open mm. up the year with the tournament. You know what? You start it off. It's almost like the prologue to the season in many ways. We went, how much serious are you going to take this? How, many, how much? Just play your pool games the first four games of the year. Go right into the tournament. Maybe you take a little break, you know, five-day break after that, and then the season starts. It would almost feel cleaner. You get the hype of the regular season being something that matters, like the, okay, opening night, these games matter. What's going on? You would get that out of the way, and it might feel a little more real. To me, part of what didn't feel real was in-season tournament, six games of regular season, in-season tournament games, six games of regular season. And then all of a sudden, the tournament was like three weeks after the last pool play. It just was too stunted. I think if you made it all right out of the gate, it would be like, all right, here we go. That tournament that kicks off the year every year, I think that you'd have something there, and it would feel a little bit more real, at least to me personally. Okay, so I think the NBA would say we're not going to do that because we don't want to cannibalize opening week for us with a thing with another product. I think the argument against that would be opening week can still be the week after the, the end season tournament starts. You could still have that, right? Where yeah. it's like, let's get the other part of it being cleaner is right now you have teams that are playing like 83 games because of the right. end season tournament and all this stuff. It's like, yeah. all right, no, just have it and then just do like a truncated whatever it is, 75 game se regular season after this, and we can just do it and it'd be way easier the nba has gotten to a point where they're just adding stuff yeah. to the point where it's so confusing for the the casual consumer i think they're going to be pushing people away whether it's first apron second apron new cba all these rules and then this in-season tournament wet night and wait if the court is a different color i don't think that that right. helps it's i thought that confused more people than it <laughs> yeah. helped more people and uh yeah just just clean it up clean it up and what if don't it didn't even it. What if it didn't even count towards the standings? Like, I almost feel like you could make oh, it separate. And then I that's why, that. like, the standings portion of the season begins on the second right. opening night, which I feel like could work. It would almost just be a little cleaner, but what do I know? Yeah, there would still have to be some sort of award tied to it, but that's the same problem they have now, and that's not our problem. So, that's not next. our problem. Uh, I'd move the All-Star break to New Year's Eve. 
Oh. I would make Christmas Day the last day of the of the first half. First of all, the All Star break coming like it feels like it's the halfway point of the season. It's not. It's two thirds through the season, maybe even a little bit more. I'd rather it be a true halfway point, which would be around Christmas. So you have the big Christmas Day games. Those are big. They always feel big, but they go right into the All Star break. I think that would make sense. Plus, All Star weekend is supposed to be a party. You have that game at like two o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon on New Year's Eve. Now we've got ourselves a party. Game's over by five or six. Everyone goes home, goes yeah. out to the parties. That's a real event. I think you should do it right then. They won't do it, of course, because of bowl season. You can't compete with oh. all the bowl season. But again, what do I care? I'm talking about for me. Yeah. On New Year's Eve, it would be kind of cool to just watch this all star game and then just go and then go out and Let's then not out. think about it for a couple of days. Yep. That'd I like it. Perfect. And it's That'd right in the perfect. middle of the year, which is good. Yep. And then my last one, I'd move the trade deadline to like the first week of January. Again, you have to get away from bowl season a little bit. The NBA loves to own the trade deadline. But what do people always say? It's so hard to make a trade in the middle of the season, which is really two-thirds way through the season, and then get them acclimated by the playoffs. If you move it up a month and a half, that gives an extra month and a half for a team that acquired a key piece to say like, mm -hmm. no, we have a runway now to work them into our system. I think that'd be more than enough. So I think it'd actually be good. I hate that sometimes, like Kevin Durant gets traded midseason. He played seven games, gets one injury, and all of a sudden there's seven games left before he gets right. into the playoffs with the Suns. Nope. Give teams a long enough runway to work their guy in and figure out who they are. We're already seeing teams, by the way, start making their own artificial deadline, right? We James Harden was traded in yeah. December like twice or something. I know there's a bunch <laughs> of teams that move, made moves in January this past year, so... Make the OG and Anobi was traded in December also, I think, late December. And so uh, early January, something like that. You're already seeing teams kind of with your logic say like, well, let's get this guy in house now. Let's make this yeah. trade earlier. But putting the deadline on it, I think would be good. And then I actually think coming right out of bowl season, because you have the big New Year's, New Year's Day slate, there's really right. like not a whole lot happening in the sports world other than like the NFL right after that. And January, I think, is like maybe the hardest month of the year in the NBA mm -hmm. in terms of all right, we're kind of done. We, we kind of know what these things are. We're kind of starting to feel a little stale. Those are really the dog days of the year. Move the trade deadline to January, and then you get more runway to talk about the new players and stuff like that at the end of the season as opposed to trade deadline, boom, playoff start, what just happened. These are great changes. I actually don't yeah. know why the NBA hasn't done them. So. I don't know why I'm not hired yet, Adam Silver. What's going on? <laughs> Let's get it going. Thanks for making Lockdown NBA your first listen every day. Every day, or just make sure you're subscribed on YouTube, Odyssey, and wherever you get your podcast. Have a great weekend.